Hello and welcome to News Click. I'm Paranjoy Guha Thakurta and with me here is Ajay Shukla. He retired as a colonel in the Indian Army. He's been a combat soldier for over two decades. He was served in uh, various parts of the country, Jammu and Kashmir, Nagaland, Manipur, Arunachal Pradesh, Punjab, Rajasthan, and has now been a journalist for several years now. He uh, uh, earlier worked with NDTV, is a regular columnist with Business Standard, has a strategic affairs blog uh, called Broadsword, and has, of course, reported from the ground in Afghanistan, Iraq, Lebanon, Syria, besides, of course, different parts of India, Jammu and Kashmir and different parts of Northeastern India was a UN, UN peacekeeper in Mozambique. Thank you so much, Ajay, for giving us your time. And uh, pleasure. pleasure. let me start with something that's very, very topical. As we are talking, I heard that, or I read that the Prasar Bharati Corporation, you know, the one, the government owned broadcaster that runs through Darshan All India Radio, has accused the Press Trust of India, arguably India's biggest news agency, of being quote unquote anti national. Why? Apparently, uh, because uh, after the Press Trust of India interviewed uh, the Chinese ambassador in Delhi, Sun Wei Dong, maybe my pronunciation is uh, not all there, uh, then the Press Trust of India interviewed ambassador. Vikram Mishri in Beijing and he quote he was quoted as saying that Chinese troops need to move back to their side of the line of actual control and he said that the only way to resolve the military standoff along the LAC is for China to stop erecting new structures now I mean you because of your reporting you have been accused of Anti, being an anti-national element by, by uh, uh, Godi media channels like Times Now and others. How do you react to the way the media has been drawn into uh, this whole standoff between India and China? Uh, let me start by saying that uh, to be called anti-national nowadays uh, is the highest form of praise in the media circles, I think. Because if you are not called, being called anti-national, that means that you are for all practical purposes uh, taking and reporting handouts from the government, uh, saying exactly what the powers that be want you to say, uh, and in that sense, not doing a reporting job as, as such, but being a stenographer for the government. तो मेरे ख्याल में जो है ये ये बोलना कि आप एंटीनेशनल हो ये तो बहुत खुशी की बात है और मैं इसको स्वागत करता हूँ बहुत 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 बढ़िया बात आपने किया आप भी देशद्रोही हैं चलिए आगे बढ़ते हैं कि जो भारतवर्ष का जो राष्ट्रदूत जो बेजिंग में है विक्रम मिश्री जी उन्होंने जो जो कहा क्यों uh, if there are any Chinese soldiers on Indian territory, that would make the government look bad. So the Prime Minister has said there are no uh, soldiers on Indian territory. Uh, and he had to go back from that statement. His official website was modified to sort of accommodate that. But when the ambassador in Beijing says that the Chinese troops should go back from Indian territory across the line of actual control, then the Indian ambassador to China is also saying effectively that there are Indian, that there are Chinese soldiers on Indian territory. So that makes him also anti-national. So welcome, Mr. Mishri, one more member of the anti-national club. Ajay, this controversial statement made on the 19th of June at the so-called all-party meeting, though the Ahmadmi Party and the Rajya Janata Dal was not represented. I'll quote exactly. And, and this was the television. Everybody saw it, even if it is not currently on the, the website, the official website of the Prime Minister's office or the Prime Minister. Which has been interpreted, literally translated. Neither has anybody intruded inside our territory, nor are any of our posts been captured. Now, when this 
uh, was said, various people commented on it, including former Prime Minister Manmohan Singh, who said that uh, the Prime Minister has to be very mindful of the implications of his words because they have an implication on national security, on strategic, and, and, and of course, uh, territorial uh, interests. And of course, the BJP reacted very, very negatively. Mr. J.P. Nadda, the BJP president, said that Manmohan Singh belongs to a political party that has helpless, helplessly surrendered 43,000 square kilometers, and there have been 600 Chinese incursions between 2010 and 2009. You know, I mean, we are really seeing a political slanging match when the country is supposed to be united. And then I, I think nobody wants more. So I think that's absolutely correct, aptly summed up by you. Uh, the whole problem is that the Chinese entry into Indian territory uh, has sort of made the government look bad, look weak, look pusillanimous. So the government has to create this fiction that no Chinese are on Indian territory. Now to create this fiction, you have to reconcile the statements of a large number of people. As it is, the external affairs ministry statement has gone against what the, the, the fiction should be because they have also talked about you know, the line of actual control and respecting the need to respect the line of actual control. Vikram Misri has talked about going back across the line of actual control. You know, uh, the, the, the fact that 20 Indian soldiers have been killed means that the Chinese were across on our side of the line of control or else that our soldiers went across the line of actual control, which is what the Chinese say. So now, you know, the official narrative has come to be aligned with the Chinese narrative. So there are so many complications in creating this fiction that no Chinese soldiers are on and on the Indian side of the line of control. And I think everybody with an ounce of common sense would ask, how have 20 soldiers died if no Chinese soldiers came across our side of the line of control? Is India aggressing against China? So I, I think it's just a... It's, it's a fiction that China is playing very beautifully. Uh, it aligns with the statements that they want to make. And, you know, depending on what China's ultimate intentions are, we might really come to regret having made the statement that there are no Chinese soldiers on All our right. side. Well, let, let's come to that in a little bit and we'll talk about jingoism and what's happening. But, but let me briefly ask you to react to some of the comments that were made by Lieutenant General S.L. Narasimhan in an interview with Karan Thapar. It was a long 40-minute interview, so I'm picking out some particular portions. Now, but what he said is that on the 15th of June, the clash at Galwan Valley began on Indian territory. It was a melee. Both sides, you know, sort of pushed each other around. There were, there were fisticuffs, there were, there were physical contacts. And it may have concluded on the Chinese side of the LSC. And there were no Chinese on the Indian side when the clash ended. This is what he said. And he said that the structure that was destroyed by the, one of the persons who, uh, who was martyred, the Colonel Santosh Babu, was a few meters on the Indian side of the LSC. And uh, now, uh, this is the whole thing. I mean, General Narasimhan is dismissing media reports on the Galwan Valley, on Depsang, on Pangong Lake, that India had agreed to some sort of a buffer zone, a no man's land along this area, which has always been ill-defined as to what is the line of actual control. Your, your, your comments, please. General Narsiman is an honorable man, uh, but he finds himself in the awkward position of having to support the official narrative. Uh, and the method he has chosen to doing it is by saying that the Chinese were on the Indian side of the line of actual control, but they were there only a few meters and they were there only temporarily because the, the melee began on the Indian side and then went over to the Chinese side. So now, you know, how convoluted can we get? You know, they are there, but they are there only a few meters. As far as I'm concerned, uh, if anybody violates Indian territory by even one meter, that person is violating Indian territory. It's simple as all that. A violation becomes a violation at the border, not after you have ingressed several kilometers inside. So, uh, you know, there are, there are far too many may have beans, might have beans, I believe, 
it is my belief and statements like that which essentially absolve him from uh, you know from having to tell a lie but at the bottom of the uh, of the entire thing is that he is finding himself in a position as a member of the national security advisory board and uh, sort of uh, advisor to the government of having to support the government in telling a lie okay uh, ajay you know, we, we are all aware that the origins of the problem are very very old and it's been i mean this uh, problem has been going on for well over 70 years uh, way back in the 70s and and we know that india and china haven't been able to agree on a fully demarcated border which is different from the loc with pakistan the line uh, of, of um, uh, the, the the line of uh, line of control but you know we've had a 62 war and now when we say that the chinese have entered 18 kilometers into the lsc and then they're building a helipad in the bangong so area now all of these were hearing a huge amount of claims uh, counter claims and most of us don't know the truth i mean no no don't know i mean we, we all know that india is the only country that held out in asia against the bri the belt and road initiative uh, the china pakistan economic corridor we, it is uh, we know that you know this whole uh, that that uh, the when when amit shah says we'll take back every inch of pakistan occupied kashmir and aksai jin you know i mean you know it's threatening both not just the bri there are two corridors the tibet jinjiang corridor and the kashgar gwadar corridor now if amit shah thought he was meant meant it for a domestic audience but the chinese clearly responded by building up the infrastructure far quicker than what we anticipated it would uh, certainly appear to uh, the unbiased observer that the home minister was extremely rash in saying what he said uh, basically threatening both pakistan and china uh, there are negotiations underway with both countries for these disputed territories uh, and when you sort of make a political statement that we will get back these territories especially having come on the back of having already made a very aggressive move in kashmir uh, then it would be uh, sort of how rash to assume that only indians are listening to this speech and uh, you know the foreign uh, people concerned are not hearing what i am saying or not taking it seriously uh, that is these are not the actions of a serious defense minister so i think that uh, you know the the ball may have been set into motion the uh, the ball that has led to the current crisis and the current standoff may have been set in motion there there could be other reasons as well as you bring bring out yourself china might be well sort of uh, seeking to give india a message that there is only one power pyramid in asia and at the apex of that power, power pyramid sits china not you uh, so there could be that dimension as well and there is of course this whole issue of infrastructure building which china has never liked on the indian side there is no reason why we should not build infrastructure on our own territory let me ask you a few questions about the geopolitical aspects of what you just commented on but before that uh, what general panag uh, har charanjit singh panag uh, he is retired as lieutenant general he says china has taken over ridges that are strategically important now strategically important for these corridors now these are 14000 feet 16000 feet above uh, sea level we know the famous statement made by pandit jawaharlal nehru not a blade of grass grows in aksai chit but one claim is that commanding officer santosh babu went with 35 jawans to negotiate a chinese dismantling of structures that had been agreed on now now this is the whole issue you had a face off on the 5th and the 6th of may and then on the 6th of june at chushul you had a first meeting of the lay uh, core commander uh, uh, lieutenant general harinder singh and the south xinjiang military regions uh, representative major general uh, lin liu if i if i'm i'm not correct uh, if i'm correct so the point is what i mean if you look at the sequence of events why don't you just clarify what happened and then i'll ask you a few questions on the bigger uh, geopolitical story yes it's hard for me to offer anyone here uh, to actually uh, piece together the precise events that took place that day 
uh, and the events that led to the killing of 20 soldiers. But we can certainly uh, assume and be sure of a few things. One is that Colonel Babu, who was the commander on the ground at the spot over there, uh, a brave man, a good soldier, by all accounts, uh, he was charged with the job of ensuring that Chinese ingress into Indian territory had been reversed, that the structures they had built on Indian territory had been dismantled, and that he, they had gone over to the Chinese side itself. Now, that tells its own story uh, to all those who wish to exercise their common sense. Uh, which side of the line of control were the Chinese? Clearly on the Indian side, they were to go back to the Chinese side. The other thing we can be sure of is that the Chinese uh, had sort of created an altercation, uh, this, this sort of uh, <coughs> uh, Indian pressure to move back on their side uh, was not taken kindly to by the Chinese and an altercation began and there, was, there were casualties in that altercation. We do not know how many Chinese were killed in that altercation. Uh, it is very regrettable that the Indian government has sought to, uh, to make acceptable the killing of 20 Indian soldiers by seeking to create the narrative that 43 Chinese soldiers were also killed. I don't care if one Chinese soldier was killed, 10 were killed, 20 or 100. The deaths of 20 Indian soldiers have to be sort of accounted for. Uh, and if there was any sort of missed uh, judgment of the tactical situation or some, some sort of militarily unsound decisions that were taken that led to those deaths, that needs to be judged regardless of how many Chinese uh, soldiers were killed. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there, there are just too many fictions being created around all these events, which are resulting in our losing focus on what the real issues are, what we should be looking at. Uh, and that is very, very regrettable. And it's a direct function of this whole politicization of this event. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the geopolitical aspects of what has happened. Now, it's hardly a secret that suddenly China perceives India to have tilted excessively towards the United States and the Quad, which includes Japan and Australia. Now, after Article 370 was written down and, and uh, all that uh, happened in, in, in Parliament, what Amit Shah said, we've also seen Howdy, uh, Howdy Modi and, and uh, Namaste Trump happening. But the point is, <clears throat> by if India joins the United States geopolitically, will it be beneficial for us? Will it be economically beneficial for us? Will it be geopolitically beneficial for us? You know, I mean, many says we are both nuclear powers, but, but India will be hurt far more than China. And, and just even this trade boycott and the investment relations or the restrictions on investment is, is all, uh, all, all going to hurt India more than us. So how do you see the whole uh, geopolitical compulsions and, and, and what, the, uh, what has happened in Ladakh, I mean, it, uh, what, what it, it means for what has happened and what is likely to happen at the end of the day? You know, uh, perhaps you can argue that President Xi Jinping has accumulated more power than any Chinese leader since Mao, Mao, Mao Zedong. We can talk about all those. We know that Modi also, Narendra Modi also needs to save, save peace. So, so how do you sort of connect all these dots together, the geopolitical dots and the geostrategic dots? First of all, the axis or the deepening of friendship with the United States of America is long overdue, is to be extremely sort of uh, happily welcomed by all parties concerned in India and will certainly be in India's national interests. Uh, that having been said, uh, this is no more so than the deepening of relationship with Russia, with China, with the European countries, and so on and so forth. Uh, I, what I'm really saying is India should be deepening its relationship with all countries. It should be deepening its relationship with the United States, but not getting into any camp or any overt alliance with one, of, one or the other of these superpowers. Uh, that has always been India's sort of multi-alignment strategy. Earlier, it was called non-alignment. Uh, it is seen as the best way to avoid getting into conflicts. 
and to maximize India's national and security interests. The problem starts, however, when as you uh, increase your relationship and your deepen your friendship with one country, if another country that is hostile to that first country you're de 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 deepening your relationship with, in this case, China with America, uh, then you have potentially a problem on your hands because there is pressure from country A, namely America, to uh, ally with, uh, with uh, that country or to at least partner that country in countering country B, which is China. Uh, there is also on the part of country B, which is China, the fear that this country, India, is getting too deep into the other country's camp and that needs to be deterred in some way. Uh, but when it takes the form of armed action as it has taken now, uh, I think we need to ask ourselves several questions here. Uh, was India really too deep into the American camp uh, is that it aroused China's sort of fears to such an extent that China felt emboldened to act militarily? Uh, secondly, which, got which got exacerbated by the COVID uh, pandemic and the economic crisis that, accompany, that is accompanying it? No, uh, Paranjoy, one of the great lessons that China has internalized from the 1962 war was that it was a tactical victory, but a huge strategic defeat because for half a century after that, it has placed India in opposition to China. And therefore, I am a little hesitant to jump too easily to the conclusion that China is doing what it is doing because it wants to deter India from joining the American camp. Because the one action that is certain if China takes uh, sort of takes any steps forward in this matter and perhaps gets into an open war with India is that India will be a, a sort of an inalienable part of the American axis uh, and be a part of the quad forevermore. So uh, is China making that same strategic error that it made in 1962? That's the question that we want to ask ourselves because if China has become smarter than it was at the time of Mao, uh, then the aim behind what it is doing is different. It is more tactical, less strategic, less geopolitical, and it could have to do something with just uh, sort of while sending a subliminal message to India, it could be more to do with tactical issues like infrastructure building and sort of encouraging India to reach a border settlement that uh, favors China or, or things of that kind. So I think we'll have to wait and see how this plays out and then Arara, jump to these conclusions, Paranjan. Okay, my last, my last question to you since you have limited time. We don't want to be jingoistic. We don't want war. Neither side may be innocent, but both sides try to build perhaps infrastructure where the line of actual control is not well defined. We, there is the pot calling the kettle get black? Are we going to get into more and more into this tutu meh meh business? The Chinese didn't react initially when the TBO, the Dollar Bay Goldie Road was being built and then alarm bells land here after, after uh, what happened, Article 370 was written down. But wait, Mr. Modi, India's Prime Minister, has invested heavily in his relationship with the Chinese President Xi Jinping. We know that they've met at least 18 times since he became Prime Minister, including one-on-one -on -one meetings at Wuhan, April 2018, in Mahabalipuram in October 2019, the famous uh, swing on the banks of the Sabarmati. So now this excludes all the time he spent when he was Chief Minister of Gujarat. But the point is, since Mr. Modi became Prime Minister in 2014, he's met the Chinese Premier at least 18 times. Uh, uh, and and, and uh, he's visited China four, uh, five times. So we've seen the belligerence on the part of Nepal on the map issue. So how does Mr. Modi save face? I go back to the final question. What do you see happening from here onwards on the India side and on the China side? Well, let me start by saying that uh, I don't necessarily think that meeting the Chinese Prime Minister numerous times is a bad thing. Uh, for India, it would be good if the Prime Minister met the, the leader uh, and the supreme leader, I should say, of China as many times as possible. Uh, the problem, however, starts when the Indian Prime Minister starts seeing these meetings 
as a substitute for the hard actions that are needed to drive forward the diplomatic relationship, or he sees it as a way of having won over the Chinese president and put him in his pocket and now China will do what India wants. Uh, that would be self-delusion of the highest order. And my fear is that in these 19 or 18 meetings, Prime Minister Modi may not have really understood Xi Jinping, but Xi Jinping has really understood Prime Minister Modi. And he has understood his vulnerability in the sense of his need to appear powerful and domestically strong to his, uh, to his audience, which leads directly to the conclusion from the Chinese side that his need to not be seen as having taken a body blow from the Chinese means that even when we go into Indian territory, Modi and his supporters will argue that we have not come there. So this is a very dangerous situation to be in. Uh, going forward from here, I mean, <coughs> that Mr. Modi is China's best choice uh, as Prime Minister for India. Uh, I think that Mr. Modi in the chair over here would give a lot of happiness to China. Uh, because he appears to believe that he is a great supporter of China, has a great relationship with China, with China's supreme leader. So why would China want to shake him off the chair? Uh, so I think that uh, going forward, there will be a modus vivendi. Mr. Modi will actively acquiesce in trying to paint that vivendi as, uh, as a sort of an equal one with China, but it will be on China's terms by the looks of it. Thank you so much, Ajay, for giving us your time and giving us your views. And Thank you for uh, a pleasure talking to you. And time alone will tell uh, what happens from here onwards. But on behalf of all the viewers of this program and on behalf of NewsClick, thank you very much once again. Thank and you. keep watching NewsClick.